Christina Talaco is the chair of the Coalition for Conservation, a think tank that looks at environment and energy policy from a centre-right point of view. She's recently returned from a fact-finding visit to the United States and Canada when she studied the potential of small modular reactors, a new form of nuclear power generation that's arousing a lot of interest here in Australia as part of the solution to our energy challenge. Well, Christina joins me from Sydney. Christina, welcome to Battleground. Uh, I'm very keen to hear about uh, small modular reactors, but first let's talk about the Coalition for Conservation, or, or C4C, the organisation you lead. Uh, seems to me there are many more environmental organisations today than there are stars in the sky, but almost all of them lean solidly to the left, and as a result they put a lot of emphasis on action by the state on the problem with capitalism, et cetera, et cetera. Your group, on the other hand, looks to harness the expertise and creativeness of business, entrepreneurs, and uh, a new technology. Is that about right? Yes, Nick, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Yes, Coalition of Conservation is an organization registered as an environmental charity in Australia, and we've been working very closely with centre-right politicians to help them develop sensible pro-market and pro-growth uh, policies that will reduce emissions whilst protecting the environment. I guess we are quite different to some of the other left-of-centre environmental organisations. We consider ourselves rational environmentalists. So we're looking at um, you know, developing policies that will also make sure that we provide energy security, that we provide, um, you know, affordability, reliability when it comes to generation of electricity in Australia. And at the same time, we want to protect the planet. And we believe that those two things are no longer, they actually can happen at the same time, especially with the amount of investment going into clean technologies. So we're always uh, giving our MPs the opportunities to network with international experts, with uh, other legislators that are producing good policy in other countries. We have taken a number of politicians to COP26 and COP27 to liaise with like-minded politicians and discuss their, the challenges in each of these countries to understand where does Australia should learn from other countries and where, where are we leading. Yeah, I, I wonder, have we got too narrowly focused on a category we call renewable energy, which essentially we mean wind, solar, hydro and batteries, rather than making our goal low carbon energy, which would open up other options? Well, naturally for Australia to concentrate and invest in renewables is really important because, as you know, we have abundance of sun, abundance of wind. So it would be silly not to capitalise on our natural resources here. And we've been doing that really well because, as you can see, uh, and we, we know that Australia is one of the top uh, countries in the development of rooftop solar. But I think that the question we have to ask ourselves is whether renewables on its own can actually guarantee 100% of our energy and secure our energy grid. And I think that the problem with renewables for me, even though our organization is very pro-renewables, is that um, renewables rely a lot on climate patterns. And so to be able to um, devoid ourselves or be more secure and not rely on these changes that are happening in climate, we can't 100% have new renewables. We should actually include other forms of baseload energy, at least for backup or for security of the grid. And renewables, uh, in a way, also have quite a large footprint when it comes to the nature. And as an environmentalist, I'm also concerned about that. But I think we've reached the point in Australia where renewables have been very successful and we won't stop you know, investing in, in renewables. But I think it's time to start considering also any type of uh, energy source that will provide reliability, affordability for Australians for the future, not just until 2030 or 2050. But if we want to replace coal in this country, which will happen because the coal power stations are retiring even earlier than predicted. And if we want to, you know, be able to get to our climate um, targets in time, we will have to actually consider other types of base load energy that can come and, and do that quicker for us. 
Well, that brings us neatly to sm small modular reactors. And, and you make the point there about the environmental footprint, how much land, how much impact it actually has on the physical environment. Uh, and that wind farm that we've just seen the video of, uh, that, that will produce in total about 360 megawatts of electricity. That's the nameplate capacity. Of course, it won't be able to feed that into the grid all the time, but it, that's the name, 360 megawatts. A small modular reactor uh, would be typically about that size. I think most of the ones they're looking at, and I've seen a figure of 18 hectares to put those on as opposed to 12.1 square kilometres for the wind farm option. So it's considerably uh, less uh, heavy on, on the physical landscape at the very least. Um, what's the reasonable times frame for their introduction if we went down the path of small modular reactors? So during this trip that I did, uh, which was a due diligence uh, nuclear trip to the US and Canada, we visited a number of different organizations and companies that are actually um, registering uh, their SMRs and their design and licensing it. We've noticed that the timeline is actually collapsing, especially because there are so many org uh, companies now that are coming up with different designs. And, you know, th so the regula regulatory side, which is really the, um, the, the side that takes longer for an SMR to, to be registered is becoming less and less um, time consuming for them. I believe that the construction of SMRs, depending on size and where they are sited, is actually between three to five years. So GE Hitachi is building in Ontario uh, with the Ontario Power Generation Company, probably what will be the first SMR to start uh, producing energy in, in Canada, and they believe that by 2028 20, it will start being commercialized. So it's actually not a very long time frame. And when we look at the fact that we need energy for the next hundreds of years and SMRs can last between 60 to 80 years, um, it's, it's actually not bad in terms of time frame. And as I mentioned, the more that these SMRs come into construction and there's, there's so much entrepreneurism behind them and a lot of investment behind them, I believe that the supply chains and, and the whole um, you know, conversion will, will take a lot less for them to, to be built. And uh, it's interesting, isn't it, that Canada should be one of the pioneers in this. Canada, of course, has a centre-left government under Justin Trudeau. Um, but they've, they've embraced this with, with great enthusiasm, haven't they? H how come you have a centre-left government in Canada that's uh, seeing the benefits of these, but you, here in Australia, because the Labour government is implacably, implacably, implacably have led, even opposed to these things, does it mean that our Labour Party has got some catching up to do, do you think? Yes, it was very enlightening for me to come back from this trip with the feeling that, and not just the feeling, but it's quite factual that there's a lot more bipartisanship in the US and Canada when it comes to uh, nuclear energy. And I guess there's a number of factors. Uh, the f number one situation is now with the global energy crisis and uh, countries wanting to be a bit more secure in their energy sources and looking at the future. As well in Canada with the different provinces, most communities want nuclear, which was quite surprising to me. So I guess there's been a shift in the perception from the public, and that's mainly due to the current energy crisis, but also the industry uh, making it clear that safety concerns with new SMRs are a lot lower, um, the waste is a lot lower, and there's different fuels nowadays for, for those SMRs to work on, which are much safer than before. So there's a much more um, common understanding amongst communities and the public, and the left organizations there, the environmental organizations from the left, have done quite substantial campaigning pro-nuclear, which has changed the, the perception in those countries. And because we don't have an existing nuclear energy um, uh, industry in, in Australia, it's very hard for those messages, those positive messages with the new advanced technologies to be spread around the community here. We've got, to hit, we've got to focus on the cost question, of course, because this is at least the stated objection of the current government to this, is, is that they cost too much. Uh, and I think we need to be honest here, Christina, don't we? Because we don't actually know. I mean, how could we know what their cost when, when we haven't ordered one and they're not available? We don't know what it's going to cost to ship and put into a site here. 
But there are some very encouraging things on the cost side, aren't they, which, which point to the fact that this is, this is going to be a very cost-effective solution. All I can say is that the economics of the SMRs is extremely feasible and affordable, uh, not only because of the evidence that there is plenty of investment, private capital coming into it playing a huge part in SMRs at the moment, but also because governments in the US and Canada are actually uh, funding quite a few of those uh, SMRs and they believe that long term they are a great source of energy which will be carbon free and very cheap for the population. So in terms of costs, it's very hard to, uh, to predict how, how much a project will cost in different countries. It depends really on the size, uh, but the beauty of the SMR is that there's so much so many different sizes uh, available and different applications available. So they vary from five to 300 megawatt. Um, they can be assembled at factories, so that makes it much lower cost than, than the traditional nuclear power stations and big infrastructure projects. And I believe that the costs will start going down, as I mentioned, because of the supply chains becoming, uh, and, and all the countries ordering those, those SMRs. There's so many countries now, not just the US or uh, Canada, but there's a number of, of countries in Europe which are actually investing in SMRs. And we know that China and Russia are probably going to be the first ones to launch their own SMRs. So I don't think that we should be basing um, the moratorium in Australia based on cost. Uh, this, these things, they, as solar panels, used to be extremely expensive. You know, these things start costing less and less. And I think it's already proven that SMRs are feasible from a cost perspective. Otherwise, there wouldn't be so much capital, uh, private capital investment into them. And, and one big saving over the, uh, you know, large-scale renewable energy option is is that you can place these, as the Canadians have done indeed, you, you cite it on an existing uh, generator, probably a coal generator that's being closed down most likely. And the advantage of that is you've got all the wires there, all the poles and wires are there. Whereas under the government's plan, they're going to have to spend $20 billion they've committed. That's probably only a quarter of what it'll eventually cost, a quarter, $20 billion just to link up uh, renewable energy sites and because they're they're very spread out and and then to transmit that uh, power interstate because you have to have a lot more interstate transmission under that system so that potentially is a big saving already right plus you're plus you're not facing this not in my backyard phenomenon are you because it's all it's already going onto a site that's already being used as a, a, a heavy electricity generator Correct, and that's the advantage of this uh, new technology with small modular reactors and also what they call the mini nu nuclear reactors that we're seeing come into play. They they're pl plug and play, so you can put them anywhere. But also, they don't need, uh, they don't require a huge uh, distribution expenditure or change in the grid because they can get into any network. Um, so, and they can also replace uh, or be placed on old retiring coal stations, which is what's happening in Canada and the US. So there's already a certain amount of infrastructure there to help them. Now you, you've spoken a lot to people in the energy sector in around the world. You, you went to the last COP meeting in Egypt. You've just been to uh, the US and Canada. What do people think about the fact that Australia has uh, a ban on any nuclear power development at all? To be quite frank, I think they find it quite bizarre. I mean, they understand the politics here. Probably in many countries, uh, uh, at one stage or another, nuclear has, has had a ban. But Australia, which has huge deposits of uranium, the capability of becoming a hub for Southeast Asia and the Pacific Islands when it comes to developing the nuclear uh, industry, Signing of AUKUS also means that we will have to develop to some level and degree a really good uh, network of, of nuclear for the nuclear industry here. Uh, they find it really hard to, to believe that Australia still has a moratorium, especially you know in the light of the new advanced technologies that are much safer and um, with, with less waste. And I believe that uh, the US and Canada made it quite clear to us uh, everywhere we went that they see us as natural partners to develop uh, together uh, the new technology for, for nuclear. And under their view, it should be a strategic 
as much as an economic decision for Australia or securing energy, but a very strategic geopolitical decision so that, you know, we don't allow uh, China and Russia to to spread their wings around our region and promote nuclear to other countries that are, you know, our neighbors. It should really be Australia developing that technology with them and be, be you know, be able to make this a much more um, uh, bigger uh, and, and, and a better supply chain for the Americans, the UK and the European countries and Canada who are working towards developing a, a really good SMR industry. So in conclusion, it would just be a jolly good idea to get rid of the moratorium right away, right? Because then we would be able to, now, even if the government is not prepared to, uh, to pursue that course, you'd have the possibility that a, a private company may come up with a, an answer which may in the end be quite attractive. And communities might want to start wanting it as well, because we've seen that Alaska and other uh, communities in, in the US and in Canada, they're actually asking the government to support and to help uh, with having an SMR in their backyard because they believe that will bring prosperity and good jobs and it will secure cheap energy for them. So it's more of a question of whether are we prepared to have that discussion in Australia and I believe that's a good time to have that discussion especially because of the current energy crisis around the world and the fact that everyone wants to secure their own energy for the years to come. So there's never been a better time to finally discuss this issue. Uh, we should really start leaving the ghosts of the past behind and have a, a good look at what the new technology uh, can offer to Australia uh, as a benefit even for renewables, to be able to include more renewables in the grid, to be able to give us that firming capacity for the future. Well, let's just give another plug to your, your think tank because I know you need all the support you can get if you're going to pursue all the research you need to do in, let's say, rational, rational low carbon energy uh, directions. It's Coalition for Conservation, C4C, and uh, I, you, you've got a smashing website. I guess going to your website is a first step to finding out about it, right? Yes, or coming to me. <laughs> <laughs> Either or. Excellent. Well, if you want, anybody wants to get in touch with, with Christina, please just send me an email, nick.cater at ADH. Uh, dot TV, and I'll pass it on. Look, great to have you, and I look forward to welcoming you back again. We'll carry on this conversation. Thanks, Nick, for the opportunity. It was a pleasure.